different. Uh, the well, there. You can start by just saying the name and where it is. Well, Romeo's Times Square is on Fairfax and Wilshire, and it's now called Johnny's. I don't think it lasted that long as a Romeo's Times Square. Romeo, whoever this guy was, came from New York and decided that he was going to have this image here in Southern California. And uh, everything in the interior was a reminder of New York. Uh, the signs on the outside were washing and flashing, and they were kind of garish, and that was the intent, was to be able to attract people to come in. I don't think it lasted that long as Romeo's Times Square, and then all of a sudden it became Johnny's. And But the washing, flashing, and the bright lights still stayed with it. And, of course, the design was maintained somewhat. What they did later was... Uh, uh, they kind of butchered the restaurant. Uh, they painted in some of the windows and didn't allow the glass to read through and things like that in order to save energy uh, or to keep the light from not you know, coming in and disturbing the customers. There are other ways to handle that, by the way. But just painting the windows out is not one of them. Um, the design itself was um, unique enough that it... Um, again attracted people it was kind of like a boomerang type of thing on the corner and it's still you know there it's used it i think it was used in reservoir dogs by um what's his name uh, quentin tarantino tarantino liked our restaurants he also did uh, pulp fiction in our restaurant five weeks before they tore it down it was uh holly's and uh honey bunny is on top of one of our tables uh with a gun um and it's in Holly's, the old Holly's restaurant, but it was called something else at the time. Then they tore it down five weeks later, but uh, Quentin Tarantino seemed to like our restaurants anyway. And the roof of the, the roof of Romeo's was different than Pan's, right? Did oh, yeah, the different design. Again, we always had to have it come up. We couldn't, give, we couldn't sell the same design to different, to different people. That was, you just didn't do that. Um, another one that was similar to that was uh, Astro Burger. It was called Conrad's or something like that. It's still around. It's a nice design. I think it's over in Glendale Boulevard or something like that. Nice design. And, um, Witch Dan was another one too. Yeah, the intersection of intersection of Wilshire and Fairfax. Mm -hmm. like, tell me a little bit. Was that a lively spot back then? Well, yeah. Uh, as a child, I used to go. Uh, we would take ride from. Santa Monica to downtown Los Angeles and one of the treats was to come to go for me was to go down the Miracle Mile and see the uh, signs believe it or not I was a sign freak at the a, a young age and I loved to be able to see the architecture and the signs and the animation of night was very important to me and Fairfax was probably the start of the Miracle Mile and um, so, yeah, that was an important corner. It was really literally a crossroads in the city. Uh, later, our offices were at the Museum Square building, which was before that called Prudential Square, for 15 years. We were right near that corner, so I got to see it a lot. And I never ate in the place. But I think the food wasn't that good. Um, I would eat everything else, but I wouldn't eat there. Uh, yeah, that was like a, you know, it was important. But I used to love going down the street and look at the Desmond sign. The biggest, the best sign, however, was the um, Pegasus sign downtown on the uh, Arco building. On the black gold building, which the idiots tore down. And it was uh, an animated uh, Pegasus, uh, you know, flying horse, whatever it was called. I, maybe I got the name wrong. Flying horse, whatever. But in neon, it was a flying horse. It was just great so yeah it was wonderful um what do you feel like what's your feeling about the preservation of buildings in los angeles well i believe in the preservation of buildings important buildings i do and um sometimes the economics doesn't pan out and economics starts to take over if it were Eldon Davis sitting here, he probably would say, yeah, tear it down. Because you know why he would say that? Because he never felt, and I think we never felt, 
that the buildings were ever intended to be iconic. They were there as a business. You did them for your client. Uh, they were going to last a certain amount of years, and we expected them to be torn down. Um, but later, other people, and we also, I guess, recognized it too, that uh, the buildings were more meaningful than that. They were a, um, they described an era, a, a particular given time in the history in Southern California. And then we found out that our restaurants were gradually, yeah, who is that? Okay. Um, go back, what did I say? Did pick up, you know, that the restaurants really defined an era. Yeah, they defined an era and uh, that they were being torn down right and left. And then it started becoming a little bit more disturbing because there were only a few of these really fine restaurants left as they were originally designed. Um, so that's, but that's, you know, that's change. Yeah. Do I like to preserve buildings? Yeah, I like to preserve a lot of buildings. And I think I have a lot of, uh, um, I mean, I live in a house built in 1919 in Santa Monica. I mean, I'm preserving the house best I can. I think I've made a lot of mistakes in preserving it. That's really disturbs me that, it, you, you know, you go back and you can see how you make a mistake in preserving a building. And this goes in preserving a, a, a coffee shop, as an example, or any of our other buildings. We did really great churches, too, as well. But we tried to preserve, you try to preserve the building as the way it was originally designed. And that's hard, because remember, these buildings were in a constant state of flux and change in order to attract people, so they had to change their interiors. They, first off, the interiors wore out in a lot of cases. Or people got tired of the interior design and they wanted something else. So what are there examples around, that are still around that are in decent shape or that yes. still retain? Yes, Pan's Restaurant is the best. It has been maintained as, as good as any that I've ever seen. I mentioned uh, Astro Burger, which I believe is, it looks pretty good. I think... Uh, the last time I saw the witch stand, the interiors, of course, are not there, but it's a health food store or something now, but the exterior is pretty much maintained. Uh, Johnny's, of course, and there's a lot of Denny's left, you know, over the years. And Norm's, actually. They've, uh, La Cienega. Uh, unfortunately, it's been butchered. You know, I'd like to be able to... Uh, they're, the best one that's preserved of the norms is in uh, Huntington Park. That was the one in Slauson. I forgot the name of the town. It's Huntington Park. And I guess um, it, it's, it's, we added on to it, though, and renovated it, but we kept the same design. Uh, the, 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 sometimes what you want to do or the client will ask you to do is come in and I don't want the same design. I want you to completely change it. And it's difficult to talk them out of it. You know, what you want to really do is to uh, maintain the original design as best you can and not have to change it. Uh, a lot of people don't, didn't recognize this type of architecture as being worthy of being maintained. Right, people always want something yeah. updated yeah, they want fresh. Up, they want it updated and fresh. I was thinking of the Eichler houses. I was reading, reading Stephen Jobs' books. I know this is not going to be... I was reading Steve, Stephen Jobs' book. He lived in an Eichler house. And I was thinking, geez, Joe Eichler. And then I was thinking, boy, there was a guy that was right of it, that really knew how to design for the masses. That's another thing that we did. We designed our buildings for the common person. That is very important. We did not design it for somebody that was rich, that could afford to go someplace else. We really felt that we wanted to come in. You come into one of our restaurants, and we're not only going to give you something which is a, uh, um, an experience, a reasonable food, but you could afford to come into our restaurants. And I remember doing, you know, some high-end dinner houses later. And I remember also, like I did the Ivy at the Shore, and, uh, you know, I can't afford to eat there now myself. I mean, I can, but I don't. Um, I like the restaurant. But... 
I think it's so much better right now. Of course, we're doing Del Tacos, Taco Bells. We're doing El Pollo Locos, and we're doing, uh, um, and we have the Wendy's coming back to today at one o'clock. Maybe they're gonna we're gonna do some work for them. We do the fast food restaurants because those are the ones that people can afford to, to do, or to uh, to go to, and they're the ones that were, from a business standpoint, makes us money and makes us stay in business. Um, we don't do no necessarily one-offs anymore like we used to. But also it's the idea of changing the average person's dining experience is really some, you know, on a massive scale, it, it really said something. Yeah, it is. Um, well, it, the dining experience, why do you come back to a restaurant? Food, service, and the dining experience of what's there. Um, how easy is it for me to get there? How easy is it for me to get in and out? Um, it's, you think about that, is it a good value? Um, what makes you come back to a restaurant over and over again? You know, these are some of the key elements. Yeah. Um, so what do you think about the term googie? Well, Googie wasn't invented by us. We, uh, Lautner, of course, did the original Googies up on Sunset Boulevard. We, on the other hand, did the second Googies. And we did it, and we have drawings of the second Googies here in the office. And I think there was a third as well. Uh, the other one was downtown Los Angeles. And for some reason, we got stuck with the name Googies, not him. And yet he was the inventor of Googies, and we weren't. But we did do the Googies, and um, so there it is. You can't walk away from it. It's the but way it, it also is. Became, it came to represent kind of the whole aesthetic. It did. Uh, if you think about it, the, 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 the OO with little eyes in them uh, was the a result of a cartoon character back in the 1920s and 30s. So Googies was kind of, uh, how do I say it, it uh, whimsical type of thing. So it's whimsical architecture. Um, I think Laudner was maybe too good of an architect to do our kind of architecture. <laughs> I've met him only one time in my life, twice maybe, I don't know, up in uh, Silvertop. He was a great architect, and he certainly did fine houses. Uh, I would never, I hated doing custom houses, by the way. I mean, he must have loved doing it. I hated working with people on custom houses. I did them, and there were some successful ones, too. But I'd never do them if I could avoid it. Just hated it. But he did these great spaces and houses and things like that. He was a great artist and a very, very fine you know, designer. So. Sure, there's no question about it. Yeah. All right, let's see. Did we cover everything? Sounds like you did. Oh, let's talk a little bit just about um, the hiring of Jack Laxer. Sure. Well, I wasn't around for the original hiring of Jack Laxer. We had uh, used several photographers, and but uh, we had used a company called Merge, we actually, I found, and I was surprised, we had hired Julia Shulman to do one of our houses, the, the houses that we did, the firm did. Um, but what made Jack Laxer unique was his three-dimensional photography. We found that we could use, we would take photographs uh, in 3D, and we have a 3D camera still here in the office, and I have used it take the 3D shots and then mount them and put them in slides and be able to give slideshows to potential clients. And you'd be able to show the client or for that matter, anybody that was interested, what the building looked like in three dimension. And that was very important. So he developed this technique, which was great. Um, he, um, I have, well, we have photographs of his in the office, but I also have some photographs at home of his as well. And um, 
I think he was just really good at doing this kind of work. But three-dimensional photographs, that was his, his, his shtick. It was his deal. Loved it. Great. Great concept. It seemed like you guys were, like, that your firm and him was kind of a good match. I oh, am. Yeah. I don't know anybody else that ever did. I don't think... I don't remember Quincy Jones ever going out and getting a 3D shot of one of his buildings. Doubt it. I mean, they just take the iconic shots. I asked Shulman one time when I was talking to him, I spent an afternoon with him, if he had worked for Quincy A.Q. Jones, and he said no. Apparently they never could come together on prices. Then he told me he'd never worked for us, but he had worked for us. He had forgotten. He was kind of old at the time. I guess he forgot. Hell, I forgot. I don't know who I worked for. You know, that's the way it goes. Julius didn't forget that often. No, he, he didn't. He had really like a steel mind. He was an like amazing individual. Track. He could remember every project oh, by yeah. number, you know, from 1 to 3,000 yeah. and the year to everything. He I have some of his photographs at home. I mean, I've got some iconic ones. And uh, one of uh, two of Neutra's houses, one of Lautner's house of the Silvertop. And, uh, and I also have the Kaufman house, but it wasn't. It was recent, but it was signed by him. So yeah, well, I've got a couple of others too. Yeah, that's what I was told, but I'm never going to sell them. Well, it's good just to know. Then let's see. One last thing is um, I didn't ask you. Oh, 